Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining our web webinar. Uh, yeah, I appreciate you joining us today. Just a um, uh, short summary of what we're going to do. I'm David Amaral, and I'm going to start the webinar. Uh, I will give a brief overview of the development of the brain, uh, and uh, then we'll talk a little bit about some recent findings uh, that have relied on studying the postmortem human brain uh, to get an understanding of the human brain and of the human brain in individuals with autism. Uh, and then I'll pass it off to Dr. Schumann, who will go in more depth uh, about a particular topic of her research, which is looking at the um, neurobiological basis of anxiety uh, in, uh, in autism, studying a part of the brain called the amygdala. So let's go ahead and uh, get started. Uh, so um, just a few uh, basic, find, uh, uh, basic uh, findings or information about the human brain. So the human brain really is a phenomenally uh, complicated uh, organ, part of our body. Uh, it has about uh, 100 billion neurons. Uh, neurons are the, the uh, cells of the brain that do all the information processing. And neurons, you see a picture on the right there, uh, communicate through chemical connections that are called synapses. And you see a picture of that on the left. Uh, so there's an electrical impulse that gets passed down the connection from one neuron to the next. And then there's a little gap where chemicals get uh, um, distributed to the next uh, neuron, uh, and so there's electrochemical communication, and there's about a hundred trillion of these synapses uh, in the human brain. The cerebral cortex, which we think is really important for um, uh, the symptoms of autism, has about 20 billion of these neurons. And most of these neurons are actually generated uh, during uh, fetal life. Uh, and the peak of generation of neurons is between the 13th and 20th week of human pregnancy. And what's astonishing is that during this period, uh, neurons are generated at around 2,500 per second. This is a phenomenon, if you think about something happening 25,000 times, 2,500 times a second. It's a incredibly rapid pace. And we're gonna come back to that uh, in a little bit to discuss some of the implications for errors in brain development uh, because of that rapid play pace. So given the fact that all of this has to happen, the, the 100 billion neurons have to develop, they have to form uh, connections, they have to form functional circuits. Um, it's not surprising that there are missteps in how the brain develops. Uh, to my mind, what is surprising is that it, it ever develops normally, and generally it, it, it does. Um, so a little bit more about brain development. Uh, the brain, uh, as I said, all of the neurons of the brain, all of the functional cells of the brain, are generated uh, by about the end of the sixth month of pregnancy. There are a few parts of the brain where there's additional neurons generated uh, actually throughout life, but that's a, actually a rare occurrence. Most of the neurons end up generated early on. Uh, and at nine months of age, uh, just at the time of birth, uh, you can see in this picture down below here that the, the brain has a, a, a looks like uh, a, a, a human brain. It has all the bumps and, and crannies uh, that uh, we call sulci and gyri. Uh, but at birth, the brain's only about 25% of the adult size. Uh, and uh, it takes several years uh, to grow to adult size, which generally happens around six years of age. You can see that in these uh, images that are on the screen now. These are magnetic resonance images of the uh, human brain of, a, of, a living, of living human individuals who we can take images of the brain at different times during life. And what you can see, they're all to scale, so that what you can see is that at one week, it's much smaller than it is at, say, two years or, or 10 years of life. And what's happening during this early period of development, uh, which is critical for the emergence of, of autism, which, as many of you know, uh, is generally diagnosed sometime around the third or fourth year of life, is that there's an enormous amount of uh, 
of connectional of connections being formed uh, and refined. Uh, some connections are formed, some connections are eliminated. Uh, and so it's a very dynamic process that takes place postnatally that leads ultimately to the, uh, uh, to the adult brain. Now, we know that uh, there are many alterations of the normal developmental trajectory of the brain in, in autism. Uh, one of uh, the uh, phenomena that we have been studying here at the Mind Institute for a number of years now is the fact uh, that um, some children with autism have a brain that's actually uh, unexpectedly large or disproportionately large. So in this uh, image here, uh, these are actually models of uh, children uh, based on MRIs of their brain. And what you can see on the left side here is the size of a typical child. These children are scanned when they're very young, about two and a half to three years of age. And you can see what a, a, a typically developing child, what the brain looks like, and you can see that the total size of their brain is uh, nearly a hundred, a thousand cubic centimeters. Uh, and most children with autism actually have the same size uh, brain. So here's a child about the same age, uh, and their brain size is about the same brain size. But what we found is that about 15% of uh, boys uh, with autism have brains that actually are unexpectedly large. We call it big, we use the term disproportionate megalencephaly. That complicated term means that their brain is bigger than we would expect for their body size. And what you can see is that this uh, child's brain with autism is about 20% larger than this child's brain and, and this typically developing child's brain. Um, we we're interested in this form of autism because what we know is that uh, these children actually have the worst prognosis. So these are the kids who show the least IQ gains over time. Uh, they have the least language function. And at this point, we don't really understand uh, what leads to the enlarged brain. Uh, and it, it turns out that MRI is a wonderful tool for studying some aspects of the development of the brain in autism. But the problem is, uh, and this is now another picture of uh, of uh, MRI picture of the brain of a child. Just it's the same brain looking at different in different directions. Uh, but the point that I wanted to make in this slide is that the smallest uh, pixel, like if you think on a TV screen, uh, the smallest dot on the screen of a, of the TV, you call it a pixel. Well. The smallest dot that in, in an MRI is called a voxel. It's, it's a volume. And the smallest voxel or the typical voxel that we have uh, in a picture that we take with an MRI uh, is about a cubic millimeter. So it's, it's this here. And in that one cubic millimeter of, of brain, uh, it would uh, include about 50,000 neurons and 100 to 300 million synapses. And the bottom line is that the resolution of MRI is too low to see neurons and neuron networks. We need to do other techniques in order to understand the brain at a cellular level. So just to show you what the cellular level looks like, uh, these are pictures of, um, of the brain of different age children. Um, this was work done many, many years ago by uh, a neurologist named Connell, uh, who studied postmortem brains from uh, individuals at different ages. And all the black dots here are actually the cells, uh, the neurons, the cell bodies. And what you can see is that at one month of age, it's much denser then at two years of age, there's more space in between the black dots. And the reason for that is that if we look at a different kind of staining, this is a, a staining that is named after the person who invented it, whose name is Golgi. Um, these tree-like structures are actually the neurons again. And what you can see is that at one month of age, uh, 
they're very primitive. There's not a lot of branches on the neurons, but over time, the, the neurons get more mature. They send out more branches, and that's because they're making more and more connections. And that's why the brain is expanding, as I said early on in the webinar, over the first six years of life, because the neurons are getting larger, they're getting more connections. Uh, and we think that it may be something related to that process of developing connections between neurons uh, that may be altered uh, in many forms of autism. Now, a, a good example of the benefits of studying the brain uh, come from Alzheimer's disease. Uh, Professor Alzheimer, who was a neuropathologist, studied uh, the brain um, um, more than 100 years ago of um, of Augusta D, who was a aged woman who had signs of uh, dementia, loss of memory, and other uh, problems. Uh, and when he looked at her brain, uh, what he saw was inside of the neurons, there are these processes that he called tangles, uh, neurofibrillary tangles. And he then went on from this first case of Augusta D to look at other cases and found that uh, older people who were suffering from loss of memory and dementia uh, often had these tangles. And subsequently, people have found that there's another uh, pathological uh, uh, feature, uh, which are called amyloid uh, plaques. Uh, and these are accumulations of protein that's not supposed to be there. Uh, they cause damage to the brain. They, uh, they damage connections. They damage neurons. And we now know that these uh, plaques and tangles are the hallmark of Alzheimer's disease. They are actually the signature. And as it turns out, as Alzheimer's disease progresses, you end up having more of these plaques and tangles. And nowadays, people can actually grade how severe your Alzheimer's disease is based on how many plaques and tangles uh, you have. Now, in autism, uh, we don't have this at this point in time. Uh, it, it turns out that the first neuropathological studies of autism weren't carried out until uh, the 1980s. Uh, some, um, some seminal work done by Margaret Bauman and Tom Kemper uh, from uh, uh, Harvard University. Uh, but subsequently, although there have been many studies uh, that have uh, taken place, uh, we don't yet have a consistent sign of disease like plaques and tangles uh, in the brains of individuals with autism. However, uh, what's interesting is as we are dedicating more effort to studying the human brain, we're starting to have some really interesting insights into brain alterations associated with autism. And I just wanted to highlight a couple of those. So this is actually a paper, literally hot off the presses. It, 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 it really came out uh, online just three weeks ago. Uh, and this is a paper that uh, was published by one of our colleagues in Autism Brain Net, Dr. Matt Anderson um, at uh, Beth Israel Hospital in Boston. And interestingly, uh, Dr. Anderson is a board certified neuropathologist. And he basically said, I'm gonna look at uh, brains uh, from the individuals with autism from a really a classical neuropathological point of view and see if there's anything that I see that hasn't been seen before. And what he found was that there in 65% of the brains that he looked at, there were indications that there was an inflammatory process taking place where, where immune cells were attacking some of the, uh, not neurons, but there's a different type of cell in the brain called glial cells. And glial cells in part are protective cells. They actually uh, develop boundaries between the brain and the rest of the body. And what he found was that uh, the, there was an immune response that seemed to cells, the glial cells that form boundaries between the blood and, and the brain and the brain and uh, what's called the cerebral spinal fluid. The bottom line is that um, this is the first paper that has found a consistent uh, a neuropathological signature uh, in a very large proportion of the brains analyzed from people with autism. Now why this is important is because uh, 
uh, if this can be replicated. And of course, science is always based on replication. But this was a very large study, uh, of, and and you know I think we're optimistic that it could be replicated. Uh, this would actually point to the fact that perhaps a, a portion of autism is due to an immune process. And it would lead us to ask questions about what is leading to that immune process. Is it something that happens early on? Is it an ongoing process? Is it something that could be interfered with? Uh, and if, if it could be interfered with, would that actually help uh, to eliminate some of the symptoms uh, of autism? I think very exciting work, and it couldn't be done unless uh, they were uh, analysis of the postmortem human brain. Another uh, area of research, this is in genetics, uh, and SPARC, of course, is uh, one of the foremost studies uh, looking at the genetics of autism uh, based on taking saliva samples and, and looking at the DNA uh, in the body. Um, Christopher Walsh, who's at Children's Hospital in Boston, and uh, his colleagues have actually found by looking at the brain that in some cases, uh, there are uh, different genetic errors in the brain that are not seen by looking at the blood or other parts of the body. And the reason for this, Dr. Walsh says, is that because neurons are generated so rapidly during early development, sometimes there's errors uh, in the, the uh, formation of the neurons in, in the DNA. And it's only errors that are local to particular neurons or a particular part of the brain. And that's called uh, somatic mutations, that they are not throughout the entire body, they're just in one tissue. And Dr. Walsh uh, predicts that at least some individuals with autism, that their symptoms might actually be related not to a general uh, genetic uh, problem throughout the body, but to one of these somatic mutations that's located only uh, in the brain. And again, it, this would never have been discovered uh, except uh, it, for studying actual brains from actual individuals with, uh, with autism. And uh, Dr. Walsh is continuing these studies. So again, we look forward to, um, to more information about this. And my final um, uh, uh, example is, is not so much about uh, autism, uh, but uh, about the fact that the human brain uh, is, is, as I said, a phenomenal structure. And while we, it has great similarities with animal brains, there is increasing evidence that some aspects of its biology are actually different than either mouse brains or monkey brains. And here's one example of it. Um, these investigators who use both uh, anatomical techniques as well as molecular techniques looking at human postmortem brains actually discovered a neuron. This, these pictures up here are pictures of uh, a neuron. The red one is actually the kind of neuron that they're talking about that has never been found in the mouse brain before. It's entirely unique to the human brain. They call it the rose hip cell because it actually looks like rose hip plants uh, uh, on the beaches in, in the East Coast. Um, but this has a unique structure and connectivity pattern. And uh, it actually is a cell that uh, is involved in inhibiting activity in the brain, and the investigators think that it might actually have uh, a, a fundamental role in um, in the um, uh, in the regulation of excitatory and inhibitory functions in the brain. So again, the reason that this is important is because we would have never discovered this cell type had we not looked at the human brain. So the I, I hope I've convinced you that by looking at the human brain, we can understand uh, a lot about the neurochemistry and the genetics and the neuropathology of disorders uh, like autism. And really the bottleneck at this point in time is that there just aren't enough postmortem brains to be able to study. We have fantastic techniques. Uh, we don't have enough uh, material to actually analyze the world uh, uh, community of autism researchers really needs more material. And in just a few seconds, I'd like to show you that we're trying to solve that problem uh, by developing Autism BrainNet. Um, autism BrainNet is a uh, uh, 
is an enterprise of the Simons Foundation Autism Research Initiative. Uh, our goal is to acquire a postmortem brain tissue uh, in order to be able to provide that resource to autism researchers throughout the world. Uh, as I mentioned, it's, it's funded by the Simons Foundation. We've, we're a relatively new organization. We were only launched in uh, May of 2014. Uh, and we have uh, uh, collection sites around the country. Dr. Schumann uh, heads one here at the Mind Institute. We have three other sites around the country. Um, if you want to know more about Autism BrainNet, uh, uh, I would encourage you to go to our website, autismbrainnet.org. You can read about uh, how we function. Uh, and I would say that our entire goal is to provide a, a sensitive and easy way for, uh, for individuals to consider doing a postmortem brain donation. Uh, and we uh, have uh, an outreach manager, uh, uh, Ms. Lillian Acosta Sanchez, who is making relationships with organizations around the country to bring education about the need for postmortem studies. Just to put in contrast, um, for, al al for Alzheimer's, um, there's been an effort going on for probably the last 50 years. And I would say that tens of thousands of brains have been donated to uh, understand the pathology of, aut of Alzheimer's disease. And the reality is that all of the interventions, all of the treatments, all of the preventative measures that are now being studied for Alzheimer's disease are based on studying the postmortem human brain. By contrast, there are only a few hundred brains that have been donated from individuals with autism and that we continue to need uh, many more donations in order to advance the science. Um, we have a hotline uh, for making a donation. And if you have any questions about Autism Brain Net, you can also go to this. Um, you can contact us through info at autismbrainnet.org. Uh, also, I would encourage you, if you have any interest in this whatsoever, to register. Uh, it's really registering for a quarterly newsletter. And you can do that at a website called takebrains.org. It takes 30 seconds to register. Uh, and you will then get a quarterly newsletter. And again, there's absolutely no pressure to make a donation. We really want to bring awareness uh, to, uh, to, to the autism community about the need and the usefulness of doing postmortem brain uh, research. So now to dig down a little bit deeper into one area where we've made, uh, I think, major advances by doing postmortem autism research, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Schumann uh, to. Uh, to tell us about the amygdala. Thank you very much for joining us. I appreciate the opportunity uh, to share our research. Um, I'm going to get into some details of a particular area of the brain that we have learned a lot about over the last few years in studying human brain tissue. But first I want to give you kind of the, the take home point. So um, mainly um, we used to think that very little changed in the brain after birth or after the first few years of life. But what we've learned from our research is that that's really simply not true. The brain is growing and changing throughout lifespan. This is happening in typical development and in people with autism. But what is exciting about this phenomenon is that it opens up opportunities really to discover biological therapeutics that can shape brain development and impact behavior well into adulthood. So this is particularly true uh, for regions of the brain responsible for monitoring behaviors such as anxiety and social cognition, um, which are common challenges for people with autism and other neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, and these regions such as the amygdala that I'm going to talk about today. But really the take home message here is that we think that it is the trajectory or timeline of development of these brain structures into adulthood that may be different in people with autism. And if we can understand the cellular and molecular mechanisms under, underlying uh, this developmental trajectory. Now, this really opens up tremendous opportunities for us to discover ways that we could perhaps change the course of 
of development and find treatments uh, for those symptoms. So the example that I'm going to focus on for the rest of our talk is a brain region called the amygdala. Um, it's located and straight in from your ear. You can find it there in a region of the temporal lobe. It's the small pink dot there. And this region is involved in detecting potential danger in the environment, orchestrating other brain regions to appropriately respond. You may have heard of fight or flight. Um, so you can think of the amygdala as what we call a danger detector. So it looks for clues um, for a potential threat in the environment, um, links this information with previous knowledge, and tells other brain regions how to respond, and then also enhances memory for those highly emotional events. So you can imagine that in humans, this action of searching for clues can become very social, such as looking to the eye region of the face to read maybe what someone is thinking or finding or indicating a danger in somewhere else. Um, and in fact, the amygdala does play an important role in modulating social behavior. So consider if it's overactive, we may interpret things that are normally benign as scary leading to feelings of anxiety in everyday situations. But if it's not doing it job, its job, then inappropriate social behavior or even risk-taking can occur. So it turns out that the amygdala takes a very long time to develop. It continues to change into adulthood. And this growth may be influenced by other brain regions in the environment um, and social interactions. But we think that it may be developing on a different timeline in people with autism, um, perhaps contributing to symptoms of anxiety. So we first discovered this phenomenon of extended amygdala growth and how that might be different in people with ASD in a series of studies where we took pictures of the brain with MRI and measured the size of the amygdala. As Dr. Emerald mentioned, we can look at how sizes of different brain regions are changing across time with MRI. So what we found is we start to create a map of um, how the structure is developing. So what we did here is that you could see amygdala size is there on the y-axis and increasing age on the x-axis. And what we found is that in typical development, the amygdala is continuing to grow in volume well into adulthood. This is not something that necessarily happens in other areas of the brain. Um, in fact, we found that the amygdala grows, um, continues to grow longer than other areas um, of the brain do. So however, in uh, the amygdala in people with autism, it undergoes a very different growth trajectory. It grows larger early on, but does not undergo the same age-related increase as in typical development. This initial overgrowth may contribute to the anxiety or social impairments in children with autism. Uh, so the next question is, we want to know why. Why is it that the amygdala is larger in children? Are there more cells or fibers connecting the cells that haven't been perhaps pruned or shaped properly um, in the way that they normally would? So then we can ask, why is it that the amygdala is not undergoing the same age-related increase in size as it is in typical development. So it's important to keep in mind that the factors that may make the amygdala larger in people with autism may be different from those that are uh, contributing later in life. So this is why we need to turn to studying brain tissue because these questions just simply can't be answered at the level of MRI. So we then embarked on a series of studies to find out what cellular and molecular mechanisms make the amygdala larger or smaller. Is it the number of cells or the number of connections that those cells make? So we first asked the question, could it be changes in the number of neurons? As you heard from Dr. Amaral, neurons are the primary cells underlying brain function. Um, th this is a cell body there in purple, and uh, the fibers coming off of it are called dendrites, and those dendrites make connections to other neurons. 
So utilizing brain tissue, we were able to count the number of neuronal cell bodies under a microscope in the amygdala of neurotypical individuals and those who had ASD during life. We did this over a wide age range. So let's start then with typical development. What we found was actually quite surprising to us um, in that the number of neurons is actually increasing by about 30% from youth to adulthood in typical development. So as I mentioned, the size of the amygdala is growing and now we know that the number of neurons are increasing as well. Um, and this again doesn't happen, really happen um, to this extent in, in the, most other brain regions. Um, but remarkably, we actually found this to be true in both human and in non-human primates. So we can now add this information to that to map of that trajectory. Um, that we had showed before in that seeing that increase in number of neurons in typical development. However, this is not the case um, in people with autism. So you can see here in this graph, in people with autism, the number of, this is mapping the number of neurons in the amygdala, um, which is there on the y-axis, there in millions, and the age of the uh, person in uh, across the x-axis and so we had a wide range of ages uh, going from about two years old up to 50 years of age and we mapped the number of neurons in the amygdala in each of those cases you can see that in um, the autism cases are in red and the typically developing cases are in blue and in fact the number of neurons starts out larger early in development in autism, but does not undergo that same age-related increase that you see in typical development. And in fact, we actually see a decrease in the number of neurons. Um, and so the question that we're wanting to know now is why that difference in the developmental trajectory is happening. We published, um, oh, sorry, we can then add this to our map so that if we have um, too many neurons in the amygdala in children with ASD starting out early and then not undergoing that same age-related increase and in fact appear to lose neurons into adulthood, perhaps indicating uh, potentially some sort of degenerative loss of cells. So we published this article last year um, in the Journal of uh, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences and are now researching what is causing the loss of neurons. Um, and of course, we need to have brain tissue to answer those questions. So then we wanted to find out perhaps if it's the connections between neurons that um, might be increasing and, and contributing to our changes in volume. And if that could tell us something about the differences in the growth trajectory of the amygdala in people with autism. So there are fibers called dendrites, which you can see there in green sprouting off of the um, cell body in blue. And we can create three-dimensional maps of the um, dendritic arbors. We can make arbors, so they look like a tree. Um, of the individual neuron, we meticulously um, count those and measure the length of every branch. And what was interesting, and not surprisingly, considering the um, uh, growth of the amygdala throughout um, into adulthood and typical development, the, uh, the dendritic length or ar arborization of those neuronal connections are growing pretty substantially up into, uh, up into adulthood. We have different ages of seven-year-old, 15-year-old, uh, 31, and up to 44, and there is substantial growth. And so then we wanted to know and look in our cases of autism and perhaps to see if it might be a different developmental trajectory. And in fact, that wasn't the case. Um, the, uh, in people with autism, those dendrites were growing and continuing to grow um, at about the same rate uh, into adulthood, um, despite the fact that there were fewer neurons in adulthood. So we didn't find, um, or we found that those dendrites were growing at the same rate, but then um, 
we wanted to know what about where the neurons actually connect and send signals to each other. The place where two neurons meet is called a synapse. Um, they are tiny protrusions from this dendritic fiber. You can see there in the picture, the little knobs in the picture, um, where the neurons actually connect to each other and send signals. So these, those little spots on the, there are actually called spines. So you can think of it as if there are too many of those little spots where the neurons are connecting that you might have too much communication between neurons. And this potentially could, we think, contribute to an overactive amygdala, perhaps um, too many connections, too much communication um, may lead to anxiety or even in extreme cases, um, potentially seizures, contribute to seizure disorders. However, if there are too few spines, um, there might be too little communication. And we actually hypothesize um, to give the story away a little bit, that perhaps if you have an overactive amygdala, that maybe it could uh, then contribute to some sort of change or loss of spines later on. Um, if you think about an engine uh, running and running and running, and at some point it, it gives out, that that could possibly contribute to the changes across, um, across age. So we wanted to ask, do people with autism have a different number of neuronal spines, uh, the place where the neurons uh, transmit signals uh, in the amygdala? So what we found was that when we counted, again, those little individual spines, those knobs on um, those, the dendritic fibers, in that um, you can see on the, on the right, we, there are two images, uh, one for typical children and one for autistic children. And the, the colored spots along um, the fibers are the number of spines and that there are quite a few um, more in people with autism, in children with autism, than there is in typically developing children. So we hypothesize again that maybe um, too much connection between these neurons in children with autism may lead to an overactive amygdala and perhaps contribute to um, the common symptom of anxiety. However, when we go and look in adults, uh, we actually find that there are fewer spines. So in typically developing individuals, the number of spines doesn't change very much from childhood to adulthood, it changes slightly. But in people with autism, there's too many, and then it appears that there are now too few. So again, we're hypothesizing that perhaps the loss of spines, um, maybe due to stress or anxiety or an, an overactive amygdala. And so the next question is, so we can add this um, to, our, to our map in that in typical development, you can see the uh, increase in volume, the increase in the number of neurons. But in autism, it just appears to be that there is too much uh, too early. So in a larger volume, uh, an increased number of neurons, an increased number of spines. But then later on, um, into adulthood, it appears that then there's a loss of volume and neuron number and spine number. So the next step is that we want to um, figure out why it is that this is happening, what other factors may give us clues, and then um, perhaps what role genes are playing um, in, in this growth trajectory. And our goal really here is to find out um, what is um, causing particularly the loss of neurons and loss of spines into adulthood. And if we can uh, determine that, then we can start to look for potential treatments or interventions uh, that may change the course of this developmental trajectory. Uh, but again, it's, it's, it's important for us to um, have brain tissue in order to be able to do that. So in, in summary from, from this part of uh, our research, so the amygdala undergoes substantial changes in typical development and in people with autism throughout life. Um, it appears to grow too large with too many neurons and spines early in children 
with autism, um, which may contribute to anxiety and social impairments, and then potentially loses neurons and spines as people with autism become adults. But the take home message and the encouraging message here is that there is a lot of change um, in brain development as, um, as typically developing people and people with autism get older. And if we understand how the brain is changing throughout life, then we have the opportunity to change that course and find treatments. So I'll turn it back over to Dr. Amral to give us some conclusions, and then we'd be happy to take your questions. Thanks, Cindy. So we're just about done, and we just wanted to have a few general conclusions. The first one is that uh, it's very clear that the symptoms of autism, both the core features and some of the co-occurring conditions like epilepsy and anxiety, are likely due to altered uh, brain development. Uh, we don't understand all facets of that, but that's uh, what we're trying to foster with uh, Autism Brain Net and work like Dr. Schumann had talked about. Um, the only way really to understand some of these aspects is uh, of cellular and molecular at a cellular and molecular level is to study the postmortem uh, human brain. Uh, and I think Dr. Schumann gave you good examples of the progress that can be made if you can study the human brain. Um, and, and again, we want to emphasize that understanding the alterations in brain development uh, and functional neural systems uh, in the autistic brain can lead to more effective targeted treatments for the disabilities associated with autism. Again, just to emphasize that the treatments that are being uh, uh, developed now for our um, disorders like uh, Al Alzheimer's disease really have stemmed from an analysis of the postmortem human brains. Uh, that's also true for Parkinson's disease and the multiple sclerosis and a number of other disorders. Uh, and we're hopeful that by understanding more about the alterations in the autistic brain, uh, that more effective targeted treatments uh, can be uh, developed. And finally, <clears throat> Analyzing the autistic brain uh, provides insight into the way the most sophisticated human behaviors and emotions are pr produced. So I, I think it's important to understand that by understanding the autistic brain, we are really understanding the human brain and how it carries out the more, most phenomenal uh, aspects of human nature, creativity, love, all the other aspects that we think are so dear to uh, humankind are, are going to be uh, better understood by the kinds of research uh, that we're trying to promote. And with, with that, I'll uh, say for both Cindy and I, thank you. Um, this is the Mind Institute. This is where we're sitting right now, and we're happy to uh, take any questions uh, from you. Thank you so much, David and Cindy. Um, can you hear me okay? Perfect. Okay, great. Um, so we did get some questions in. Um, this first one, we had a couple variations on this question, but I, I think it might be for Cindy. Uh, so people were asking about changes in neurons and the amygdala and um, if that relates to changes in behavior or levels of anxiety. So I think uh, that is, uh, that's a great question and actually probably the ultimate question that um, our research and what we're trying to find out. We are uh, making efforts towards trying to, um, through Autism Brain Net, through the, uh, the um, uh, through Autism Brain Net to collect more clinical information as much as we possibly can and then to be able to relate that information that we can get from that, that those medical records and then also interviews with um, the families of the donor and try to collect that information and then relate it to uh, our findings. So, and, and one other thing to add to that is uh, that we do get clues from imaging studies that the amygdala is uh, functioning differently in, in some individuals with autism uh, related to, uh, you know, to the way uh, in faces are interpreted, particularly angry faces or scared faces. Um, and uh, there is a sense that, as Cindy was saying, uh, either the, the amygdala is too active or in some cases not as active. Uh, 
but the the reason for that is, uh, is still unclear. So I think what we're trying to show is that the reason the people with autism may have anxiety is because there is either a, a loss of neurons or a, or a, a altered program of development of neurons. Uh, and, I, and I think that, you know, that's an important uh, step forward because it, by understanding, uh, and anxiety is very rampant. And some of the other studies that we have here going on at the Mind Institute, we found that 68% of people with autism actually have debilitating anxiety symptoms as well. So if we could understand that and, and even just better treat the anxiety component of autism, we're certainly gonna improve the quality of life of many, many people on the autism spectrum. Okay. Um, someone had a question about the Autism Brain Net program and um, what kinds of um, safeguards are in place uh, for the, the donation. So keeping them, um, so that you know, there's not a destruction of of the material. So someone kind of, I think they're just wanting to understand the logistics and where they're stored and how they're stored. Yeah, so that's a really good question, and it probably comes from someone who is familiar with the fact that in a predecessor to our program, there there was actually an unfortunate loss of tissue uh, happened many years ago, and we've learned from that. So um, we ensure that uh, the tissue is stored in uh, highly protected, so some of it is frozen, some of it, uh, actually most of it is, is actually frozen, and the freezers that we store the tissue in are safeguarded with backup systems, uh, there's, uh, they're locked, there's video cameras uh, on the, on, on the um, directed at the freezers as well. So we've, we've made every effort to have the uh, tissue itself uh, be safeguarded, as well as every effort to ensure that the information from the families uh, is safeguarded as well. So um, when we send tissue to an investigator, for example, we never tell the investigator uh, the name of the donor or the name of the family. It's, it's all coded uh, and we provide information about whether the individual had autism or not and whether, for example, they might have had epilepsy or some other con condition. But we never divulge uh, family details, uh, so we make sure that that's secure as well. So uh, I, I would say that we have learned from the situations in the past and we've made every effort to ensure that the the tissue is highly safeguarded. The other thing too is that the tissue is at multiple sites, so we have the safety of of having uh, you know, not all the tissue in, in in one place. But but bottom line is that at each of the locations where we have tissue, we've implemented very rigorous safety procedures. Okay, thank you. Um, this could be for uh, for David or Cindy. What are some challenges in studying causes of autism? A kind of a big, broad question. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll start ahead. with one of you think. Okay. So, you know, I think uh, one of the challenges is the fact that, um, you know, some people have said when you've seen one person with autism, you've seen one person with autism. And, and the, the fact is that, you know, from Spark and other uh, similar kinds of studies, we know now that there are nearly 200 genes that have been implicating and Im implicated in, in, in causing aspects of autism or increasing the risk for autism. Um, so, and you know, every person with autism, um, you know, has of course the core features of it, but then, um, you know, 30% of people with autism have uh, seizure disorders. 60% uh, uh, or, or so have anxiety. Uh, may not be the the you know the thirty percent who have epilepsy have also anxiety. A lot of people have gastrointestinal problems, and so there's a an incredible sort of diversity, uh, or you know we call it heterogeneity, um, about the the features of autism. And I think the bottom you know in the end, as I mentioned early on, for example, we found that only fifteen percent of boys with autism have the big brain form of autism. Now, for them, that's an important thing because it means their prognosis is going to be very difficult, and we're trying to figure out how we can help those kids as well. But interestingly, 
uh, 85% of kids with autism have a normal sized brain. So, so, you know, that means that when we're trying to study uh, the brains of individuals, we have to get a large enough number so that we can uh, deal with different subgroups of people with autism. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges for doing this, you know, in a, in a genetic study like, like Spark, uh, the way you, you, you deal with that is that you get saliva samples from 50,000 families, you know, you know, so that deals with the heterogeneity. For an imaging study, like we're doing here at the Mind Institute, uh, we actually have hundreds of, of, of uh, participants that we are able to image. Uh, for doing brain uh, research, like Cindy talked about, uh, typically there are far fewer cases uh, that we have access to, and we realize that we're probably missing things because we don't have an adequate number of cases to deal with this uh, diversity or heterogeneity. So I would say the, the biggest difficulty in trying to understand the causes of autism uh, is the, the heterogeneity of autism. I think I can just add to that or more underscore the point uh, in that um, because there, it appears that there is so much heterogeneity in autism, we really need to have all of these different approaches. So we need to be able to answer questions uh, like maybe when and where in the brain um, that might be developing differently in people with autism. And those aren't the best questions to ask in when we're looking at postmortem tissue. That's really important to turn to these larger longitudinal studies like we we're talking about with Spark and with the MRI studies. And then for postmortem studies, we need to ask much more specific questions. Questions like, okay, we know it's growing bigger, we know that from MRI studies, for example, and now we really need to know why, and that requires brain tissue to do. So that's probably, that is one of the biggest challenges, just to underscore what Dr. Amaral said, is that we have to be very um, careful about the questions that we ask and choosing the best approach in order to answer them. Okay, thank you. Um, Let's see, what else do we have? So, um, Cindy, you talked about uh, a lot about the amygdala. Are there other areas of the brain that researchers are focusing on? And if there are, have there been any studies that have used um, tissue from autism brain net? So I think there's, um, yes, there are several studies and it just happens to be um, that the amygdala is probably one that we know more about. We've studied it longer than some of the other regions or a more extensive scale um, in brain tissue. Um, other areas that, um, that have been the focus um, in, in looking at the autism brain have been in the frontal cortex, um, particularly in the um, outside um, part of the prefrontal cortex, um, what we call dorsolateral prefrontal, and then other areas of the temporal lobe, which is where the amygdala is located. Um, and those have been um, fairly common areas to look at. Although we don't know as much about those areas, in some of the cases we have seen similar patterns to what we see in the amygdala for example too many neurons early on and or maybe even a loss of neurons later on in life um, but at a different time scale so it, it may be shifted uh, earlier and later in different brain regions and some people ask you know what why do you have to do this in the human brain can't you do it in a, in a mouse brain? And um, the areas that have been of most interest to investigators uh, using autism brain net tissue are the areas like the frontal cortex that Cindy mentioned that are really primitive in the, in the mouse brain. One of the most important areas uh, in autism research is a part of the temporal lobe next to the amygdala called the fusiform gyrus. And that's where uh, the human brain does face processing. And as I'm sure many folks know, uh, people with autism tend to uh, not make um, face contact or eye contact um, uh, as much as typically developing individuals. 
Uh, and there's the thought that uh, the fusiform gyrus uh, may be functioning uh, differently. There's actually quite a bit of MRI data suggesting the fusiform gyrus is, is altered. Uh, and there are pr at least preliminary studies, uh, I think more needs to be done, that the connectivity and neuronal architecture of the fusiform gyrus are different in, in autism. Um, a lot of this needs to be replicated, and uh, we encourage investigators to reach out to us to, uh, you know, to see what tissue is available uh, so that we can promote additional replications. Because again, a lot of the initial studies were done on very uh, small numbers of samples. I think Dr. Schumann's studies are, uh, are an exception that have you know, quite a few cases and controls. In fact, I think uh, her work is, has the largest number of cases and controls uh, ever, ever done in autism. Um, and we, we're trying to promote that. We would love it, other investigators to be able to reach out to us to request tissue and to look at some of these other brain regions in the same uh, comprehensive way that Dr. Schumann has done in the amygdala. Okay, thank you. Um, just, we just have time for one last question. Um, what is the criteria to, um, to join the Autism Brain Net program? So um, a donation can come from anybody who is diagnosed um, with autism during life. Um, so most of our donations come from next of kin who have a family member who have, has died and, and uh, they either expressed interest themselves or the family has expressed interest in making a, a donation. Uh, regardless of what co-occurring conditions uh, may have uh, taken place during life or if it's a genetic form of autism or non-genetic form of autism, uh, any, any individual who was diagnosed with autism um, uh, uh, can, is acceptable. Uh, and I should say that we have wonderful clinicians who work with the family uh, uh, in the process of making a donation. Uh, there's absolutely no cost associated with it. Um, and uh, the clinicians work through the process of, of, of interviewing the family and getting to know something about the, the donor individual. Uh, and we, we are we, we realize that it's a traumatic time in, in a family's life and we try and make uh, our, our approach as sensitive and as caring as, as possible. And I have to say that we have wonderful clinicians who uh, handle uh, that facet of the process. We are also interested, because uh, we're always comparing uh, individuals with uh, autism to typically developing individuals to see if there are differences. So we are also interested in uh, uh, in brain donations from uh, individuals who do not have autism or, or do not have any other uh, prominent neurological or psychiatric disorder. Uh, in this case, we um, are a limited, more, little bit more limited uh, in the sense that we uh, are accepting donations from people who are 50 years uh, of age or younger. Uh, and we do that because some of the, the other uh, brain banks in the United States, particularly uh, something called the, the NIH Neurobio Behavior, Bio Brain Bank, sorry, Neurobio Brain Bank, um, has been collecting uh, brains of older individuals for a number of years. And, and so there is an ample uh, 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 supply of, of brains from older individuals. Uh, but we would accept donations from um, non-autistic individuals as long as they are younger than uh, 50 years of age. And again, uh, if, you, if you go to our website or if you have a specific question, uh, email us at info at autism brain net, uh, then we will be happy to uh, answer any questions uh, that you might have about the process. And thanks again uh, to everybody who's been listening uh, to listening to to us. Uh, we we appreciate you taking the time to join us. Yes, thank you so much. Um, we are going to wrap things up here. Um, I know that we didn't get through everyone's questions, and I did see a number of questions about treatments and therapies. There are resources on the Spark website, such as webinar recordings and articles about those topics. So feel free to check that.